This is the window in the Texas School Book Depository that changed history in a dramatic, terrible way. You get a clear view from here down to Elm Street in the city of Dallas. Lee Harvey Oswald took out a rifle right here and pointed down toward the motorcade that was bringing President John F. Kennedy through town. Shots would ring out at 12.30 p.m. on Friday, November 22, 1963. Shots that would reverberate across the country and around the world. Kennedy would slump down in his limousine. America's Camelot, a time of hope and optimism, had suddenly ended. We're still fascinated by how the death of one leader can impact a people, a culture, for so many decades. Fifty years after John F. Kennedy's assassination, people are still captivated by the event that happened right here by Elm Street in Dallas, Texas. Was there a conspiracy behind that fatal shooting? Theories about Oswald accomplices still spin around. How did those two or three shots from way up there hit so precisely way down here in a moving vehicle? Why did this very popular president have to die? And what might have happened if his term continued? This Dealey Plaza structure that housed the Texas School Book Depository back in 1963 is now the Dallas County Administration Building. Local government offices occupy most of these floors. But on the sixth floor, there's a museum that pictures details about that fateful day that ended Kennedy's presidency. It also features his life and legacy. Let's take a look. What we try to do here is tell the, the basic history of President Kennedy, who the Kennedy family is and why he came to Texas that day. So this is what it was like, and right out that open window where the box is sitting on the ledge there in front, that's where the shots were fired from. One of the stories we try to tell in the museum exhibits is the Kennedy legacy. Now, younger people who weren't around when he was in office, they don't have as much interest in his legacy, but the legacy is really quite interesting. I believe that this nation should commit itself to achieving the goal before this decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the earth. Although it started under President Eisenhower in the 50s, when President Kennedy took office, one of the first directives he issued was, we're going to land a man on the moon in this decade. And this was just a shocking revelation, especially to people in the business of supplying people and equipment for, for that project, because this was all of a sudden a big boost for them. And of course, the U.S. space race has, has uh, yielded unbelievable treasures. The Cuban Missile Crisis was one of Kennedy's most daunting challenges. He didn't want nuclear warheads aiming at his country so close in that Caribbean island. So he sent out ships to block the Soviet vessels that were bringing rockets into Cuba. That was the closest the world ever got to a devastating nuclear war between superpowers. It was the scariest of standoffs. But Kennedy's cautious and sensible strategy would manage to send the Russian missiles back home. But it just indicates what the Kennedy presidency was like. There were extreme highs and extreme lows just in the few short thousand days. Yes, Kennedy would build quite the legacy. He'd become one of the more charismatic US presidents. But then came that fateful day. Right here on Elm Street, is where a few bullets interrupted history very dramatically. Let's look at just how it happened.
President Kennedy's motorcade tour through Dallas was planned to give him maximum exposure to the crowds here. He rode in an uncovered limousine with his wife Jacqueline, Texas Governor John Connolly, and Connolly's wife Nellie. They were headed toward a luncheon with the civic and business leaders of Dallas. There were plenty of enthusiastic people for this foursome to wave at, of course, weaving through downtown, passing right here by Dealey Plaza. They were only five minutes from their destination. Now, this southern state of Texas hadn't been a big supporter of Democratic presidents for some time. But Nellie Connolly, the First Lady of Texas, turned around to Kennedy and said, Mr. President, you can't say Dallas doesn't love you. Kennedy smiled and nodded as people here shouted greetings. But then came the rifle shots. This is the North Pergola. It overlooks the spot where JFK was fatally wounded. Here at the one end, you'll see a pedestal. This is where Abraham Zapruder stood. He just wanted to capture Kennedy on his home movie camera, but he would accidentally document this terrible assassination. Abraham would record the most analysed 26 seconds of film in history. At first, those shots didn't really ring out for most people on Elm Street. There was plenty of crowd noise and car noise all around them. The shots didn't sound that different from a firecracker or a vehicle backfiring. But then the crowd noticed something awful. Kennedy wasn't waving anymore. He had slumped onto his wife's lap. Governor Connolly was a World War II veteran. He recognised the sound right away as a high-powered rifle. As Kennedy had waved with his right arm, a rifle bullet penetrated his upper back, went through his right lung and exited his throat. Kennedy quickly clenched his fists in front of his face, leaning forward and to his left. Jacqueline put her arms around him, suddenly terrified. A bullet struck Connolly in his upper right back. Was it the same one? That question would perplex investigators for many years. A second or third shot rang out. This was the fatal one, striking Kennedy's head. US Secret Service agent Clint Hill ran forward and tried to get on the limousine to protect the president. Jacqueline actually crawled back onto the rear trunk lid, perhaps to help him. Mrs. Connolly thought she heard Jacqueline cry out, they've killed my husband, they've killed my husband. Those bullets came from here, the sixth floor of the Texas School Book Depository. This area has been preserved to look just like it did in 1963. Lee Harvey Oswald had stepped over to the window after locking the door behind him. He held a Kakano rifle with a scope that could zero in on a target in the distance. In October of 1963, Oswald had come up from the city of New Orleans where he grew up and he got a job here at the book depository. Days before Kennedy's arrival, newspapers were describing the route of the presidential motorcade it would pass here. On Friday morning, Oswald arrived at his workplace with a big paper bag. He'd left his money behind and his wedding ring. A co-worker would spot him here on the sixth floor at 11.55 a.m., 35 minutes before the assassination. 
Lee Harvey Oswald had joined the Marine Corps as a teenager. Going through their intense training, he knew how to handle a rifle very well. It was here at this southeast corner window that rifle shots would ring out that penetrated a governor, a president, and US history. Oswald would quickly hide from the window in here and then cover his rifle under some boxes. Then he went down to the second floor using the rear stairwell. In the luncheon room, he ran into a police officer. The hunt was already on for who had fired those deadly rifle shots. But Oswald's supervisor identified him as an employee, so the officer let him pass through. Later, people would recall Oswald seemed very calm with a soft drink in his hand. With the President lying on the First Lady's lap, the motorcade sped toward Parkland Hospital. Oswald would go out of the front staircase just before police sealed it off. A little later, he was walking down a sidewalk in the Oak Cliff neighborhood. Police officer J.D. Tippett was driving by, listening to urgent messages about the assassination. At this point, Oswald's supervisor had pointed out to police in the sealed off book depository that Lee Harvey Oswald was the only employee he knew was missing. Officer Tippett decided to ask this man a question or two. He called Oswald over to his car and stepped out. But just then, Oswald pulled out a pistol and shot him four times. As Tippett died, the assassin fled the scene. A little later, Johnny Brewer spotted a suspicious figure and saw him slip into this Texas theater without paying. Johnny alerted the ticket clerk and he called the police at 1.40 p.m. Officers swept into this dark theater and put a hand on Oswald. He resisted arrest, attempting to draw his pistol, but the police restrained him and took him to the station. Later, he'd be charged with the murders of Kennedy and Tippett. In trauma room one at Parkland Hospital, physicians had identified Kennedy's condition as moribund. That meant he had no chance of survival. They would try, but that shot to his head was fatal. A priest named Huber, standing at his bedside, would draw a sheet back from the president's face and administer the last rites. The White House press secretary would officially announce Kennedy's death at 1.33 p.m. This was the Peace Corps president, the one who took America through the Cuban Missile Crisis. His administration had started civil rights legislation, and the man sworn in after the assassination, Kennedy's Vice President Lyndon Johnson, would become the president behind real civil rights reform in this country. So there were a lot of questions after Kennedy's death, a lot of investigations, a lot of theories thrown about. What was really behind those rifle shots? Wasn't there a conspiracy? What political forces would want Kennedy killed? Surely such a tragic historical event couldn't have been pulled off by just one man, Lee Harvey Oswald. Many historians look at the mid-60s and the late-60s as a time in this country where people seriously questioned the United States government and perhaps lost faith and trust in the government. And that really hasn't stopped because this is such an interesting subject it's so visual in nature, it lends itself to television and movie uh, programs uh, the, that the Kennedy assassination story lives on. Young people come into this and they don't know anything about Kennedy or his policies or why he was uh, a great leader to so many in those days. They don't care about that stuff. They want to know who did it. They want to know who killed him. Uh, so I, I can't even imagine 
decades from now, that there won't be people walking around out there in Dealey Plaza and pointing and scratching their heads and trying to make some sense of what happened that day. Well, the assassin would remain forever silent. On Sunday, November 24, he was here at the Dallas Police Headquarters being led through the basement. Officers were preparing to transfer him to the county jail. Quite a crowd had gathered though, trying to get a look at the alleged assassin. Dallas nightclub operator Jack Ruby suddenly stepped forward with a revolver and shot Oswald in the abdomen. It proved a fatal bullet. Now, police officers wouldn't be able to interrogate the man. But there were plenty of other investigations. The Warren Commission, created by President Johnson, would look at all the facts in depth. Their conclusion? Oswald had acted alone. Those three shots came from his rifle. But many Americans just had to believe there was some big conspiracy behind that fateful shooting. I was a senior in high school when it happened, and my father, who fought in World War II, was scared to death that the Russians were behind it, and World War III was about to begin. That was the first conspiracy theory. Then when Jack Ruby, a local Dallas nightclub owner with mob connections, uh, killed Lee Harvey Oswald, the suspect, in the very state from which Lyndon Johnson had become president, it made you wonder if Johnson was behind the assassination. So that was the second big theory. But over the years, other theories have come forth. Uh, the, the CIA, because they despised Kennedy for various reasons, they had him killed. Close to a thousand books have been published about the assassination. And over 95% support some conspiracy. Some advance the theory that pro-Castro Cubans made it all happen. And there were all kinds of claims about how the evidence had been altered. Dallas police must have changed those autopsy shots to give the appearance that the wounds were caused by one rifle, one gunman. Yes, a tragedy compels us to create satisfying explanations. A big event needs a big plan behind it. The problem with the Kennedy assassination is there's no known motive for Lee Harvey Oswald. And yet, to this day, all of the evidence points to him and him alone. But most people just aren't satisfied that one guy, one little tiny individual without any connections to anybody, apparently, was able to do away with a very popular leader of uh, one of the biggest and most powerful countries on the planet. It's just this lopsidedness doesn't make sense. So as long as there are holes in the story, and people can plug in their own answers, they'll probably keep doing so. Well, we'll never be sure, of course, if there were other people who helped Lee Harvey Oswald. But here's the basic fact behind that assassination. Here's the essential truth which a lot of people have ignored. It was a man's character that produced that killing. That's at the bottom of it all. Lee Harvey Oswald grew up a rather withdrawn and temperamental kid. Once he was even accused of threatening his half-brother's wife with a knife. Later, truancy from school led to a psychiatric assessment. This young man was found to have a vivid fantasy life, imagining scenes of power to compensate for his shortcomings and frustrations. Oswald joined the US Marine Corps just after his 17th birthday. He was trained as a radio operator and served in Japan, but he got into trouble playing around with an unauthorized 22 handgun, accidentally shooting himself in the elbow. Then he got into a fight with his sergeant, who reported the incident, and he was court-martialed. After that, Oswald claimed that his mother needed care and received a hardship discharge. Oswald flew to Russia and played around with becoming a Soviet citizen for a while. But then he got bored and came back to America. Settling in Dallas, Oswald was hired by a graphic arts firm. But he was inefficient and quite rude, to the point that fights threatened to break out. 
After he was fired, he bought a 6.5 caliber Kaikana rifle by mail order using another name. Lee Harvey Oswald obviously had personal problems. There may well be conspiracies in this world, but the bottom line when it comes to terrible deeds is human nature. Tragedies happen most frequently because we are bent in the wrong direction. Well, Lee Harvey Oswald's background is really interesting in that he was one of life's losers. We've all known people in life who just, no matter what they do, no matter how hard they try, they fail. At the time of the assassination, Lee Harvey Oswald had a minimum wage job here in the Book Depository Building. He had no future. Most every job he'd ever had, he'd been fired. He had two baby girls and a wife who despised him. They were living apart. He had no prospects. And in short, he was a guy who had no future. And when men are put in that position, they tend to do very dramatic things. When Oswald woke up that morning, uh, he had spent his last night uh, with his wife. He left virtually all his money and his wedding ring on the dressing room table. You know, when a man makes a statement like that, that's a very powerful decision. He's decided to do something drastic. Did he go out and kill a president for some reason? Well, that's what the evidence says. Was he going to do something else and just call it quits or something? Well, we don't know. Jack Ruby cheated history, so we'll never know. <laughs>